going to introduce our first speaker in this uh, in this track, uh, Edward Swiderski the third uh, began his career at Voyager Net as an intern while attending Michigan State University, and uh, upon graduating, he immediately joined uh, Analyst International in various software development capacities. Um, now he's uh, he is uh, also the uh, founder of uh, Green Canyon, a web services consultant firm, and a director of the Global Education Open Technology Foundation, which uh, partners up with other technology organizations to bring technology to less privileged students. Um, here today, he's going to be talking about the question, is licensing still relevant? Um, now, keep in mind that, um, you know, Albert Einstein once said that uh, computers are useless because they can only give answers, right? Um, so what I would expect in this, uh, in this uh, dialogue here is that we keep it a dialogue. So uh, feel free to, you know, as we'll see this, Feel free to uh, challenge the assumptions of our speakers and make sure that we uh, make this a dialogue rather than a monologue. So, with that, I give you Edward. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Everyone, uh, I'm Ed. As Phil said, uh, Ed Swiderski. Uh, I'm a partner at a, uh, a local consulting firm here in Chicago. We're based in the Loop. Um, we primarily focus on open source platforms. We build our, our projects uh, that we work with. Uh, we also do some .NET consulting too. Uh, give you a little bit of background about me. Uh, I came from kind of the Microsoft ecosystem. I, uh, when I graduated, I, I worked for a Microsoft partner, and then I eventually joined Microsoft in a, uh, in a, in a government consulting role, handling the Midwest. So I sold consulting services to Microsoft for a number of years. And uh, so, so my background is uh, kind of a hybrid. I, I've done development, I've done sales, I've done, a, I've done a, a blend of different roles. And um, so licensing to me is a interesting topic coming from a, a Microsoft kind of ecosystem, but always being an advocate of, of open source. And uh, I know it kind of contradicts itself, but uh, the truth is that my role at Microsoft was uh, very, you know, being in a government position, it was, uh, it was sort of to be a liaison to the open source community. So, um, today, I want to talk a little bit about licensing. I do not want this to be a monologue, though. I really would like this to be a, a conversation. I know some of you guys are way in the back, um, but if you want to speed up, you can. Uh, I certainly am not an expert in licensing, uh, but I feel like I, I, I know enough to, to, to get in trouble with it. Um, so, let me just, uh, let me just move on here to the next slide. So, yesterday morning, I was watching uh, Regis and, and Kelly, and uh, who would have predicted open source in Hollywood? Um, you know, Jake Gyllenhaal was on, uh, was on uh, Regis and Kelly, and he defined the source code as being a computer program that enters your body. So. That to me uh, is is powerful. That's a powerful statement. I would love to hear more from Jake Gyllenhaal on his on his topic. So, on the eve of the release of the the source code, uh, I'm happy to be here today. So, anybody gonna see it? All right, all right. Yeah, I don't know if Jake knows that much about open source or source code, but whatever. Um, so. Another little fact about me, I was on uh, a TV show called The Bachelorette. I was actually the guy that, that she, she picked um, to, uh, to get engaged, kind of a shocking thing. But you can see how I was ahead of Jake, and I wanted to get Tux out there. So I had my, my tattoo of Tux there, and I, I brought a little coffee cup onto Ellen with me with Tux on it. So <laughs> she didn't even know what that was. but. Uh, so, um, again, licensing is, uh, I think it, it kind of flares a, a very good conversation. Um, historically, I think it's, it was uh, much more relevant than it is today, and I, I think that's a challenging statement for all of you guys. I'd like to get your feedback on it. Um, but you can see that it has definitely ignited debate in the past, and, and there's been uh, controversy and, and major lawsuits involved with it. Um, so here's a statement from Steve Ballmer. Uh, Linux is a cancer that attaches itself in an intellectual property sense to everything it touches. Wow. That's another, that's another powerful thing. And actually, I'd, I've met Steve Ballmer. I've worked with him. I've worked with Bill Gates. Um, and they're not bad guys. They actually, uh, they're, they're not bad guys. But that's a powerful statement. And uh, I, I really don't know if it applies um, at all. So um, 
I want to spend a few minutes just to go through my kind of perspective on, on uh, open source, floss versus commercial software. And uh, again, I'm not an expert. That's why we have people like uh, Dahlia Saper, who runs her own law firm on IP. Um, but I definitely would like to get your guys' feedback on it too. So, um, so quick, uh, quick background. So commercial software, monopolistic, opportunistic, um, you know, very uh, kind of lagging in innovation, a necessity, uh, it's pervasive, generally understood from a, from a cost perspective. Um, you build the software, you sell it, and you make money. Um, makes sense, right? Open source uh, definitely promotes innovation. Um, organizations like Flourish, obviously, it, we're spreading the, the good the, the, uh, wisdom of open source and the gospel. Uh, it's free, and it's free, as in freedom. Um, it's, uh, it's a bit taboo still, I think, in business. Uh, up until recently, and it's certainly misunderstood, I think, from a licensing perspective. There's a lot of uh, confusion out there. Uh, there's, a, there's a bit of an identi identity crisis, too, with um, you know, GPL and other uh, uh, variants of open source licensing. And, and, uh, and so uh, I think that traditionally it's just been, a, it's been an easy road for commercial software. So if we look at uh, a little bit deeper into commercial licensing, um, again, you know, it re represents America, right? Capitalism. Um, look at, we've got an aerial there of Bill Gates' house. Uh, it's on Lake Washington, not, not bad. Um, makes people rich. Keep software convoluted and confusing. So this is, uh, this is a statement that I think is, is kind of important in, uh, in the history of commercial software because the more confusing it is for an organization or an individual to understand what they're using as an as an information worker, I think uh, it keeps uh, it keeps more value in the software. So I don't know if that makes sense, but maybe maybe it does. I don't know. Um, and I think of of open source as sort of the opposite, right? But the real problem has been challenges in history. So you've got you know major groups on the open source. Uh, side of the house that are disagreeing on certain standards and uh, goals, right? So why are we here? Why are we fighting for freedom in software? And, you know, so uh, I think there's been definitely a weak marketing uh, engine, which maybe that's something that's deliberate, right? Maybe we don't want a massive marketing engine for, for open source. We want to keep it community-based and, and non-corporate. Um, I think it's, there's confusion, certainly, in, in the different houses and in different distributions of not just Linux, but every other variant of an open source uh, <clears throat> tool. Um, in, the, in the history of open source, I think there hasn't been an, a real good business model. Um, you know, Red Hat might be an organization that uh, historically has, bu has been very well at, uh, has done very well at, at generating revenue and services and uh, also building upon a, a solid platform in a commercial environment and in an enterprise environment. Um, but other than that, I don't think there's really been too much success within the past, you know, 10 years, um, prior to the past five years, I would say. I don't think there, there really was, unless anybody has an example of someone. Um, just a little fact here. So open source software claims to have saved $60 billion in, uh, in software per year for consumers. Now, um, I would love for that to be, uh, you know, from from Ubuntu being distributed, you know, on uh, online. But uh, I don't think that's the cause of it. I think it's obviously the, the web server side and, and the LAMP stack. Um, so just a little little fact there that uh, not many people actually know about that are non-technical, I should say. So if we, we fast forward to today, I think um, we're starting to see these these lines kind of come together, right? So uh, Commercial software is certainly getting more innovative. It's getting more communal, um, certainly more more relaxed from a cost perspective. Uh, you know, I came from Microsoft, so uh, you know, I typically would work with my customers. Although I wasn't selling Microsoft services, or I wasn't selling Microsoft software, I was selling Microsoft services. So um, you know, my my licensing counterpart would come to me once a year, and, and guess when that time was? It was, you know, during the renewal time for my customer. So, um, you know, that was a necessity, right? You have to renew your software. So, um, that said, I think recently the, the, the cost model and the, uh, the whole SKU model of, of commercial software is changing. Um, 
and that's part of the the cloud kind of advent of the the cloud and and uh, and software as a service. But so the model's changing. Um, on the uh, GPL and the, and the open source side, I think, you know, it's not much has changed, but it's certainly more acceptable in the business community. Um, you know, it's becoming more ubiquitous. It's still a little bit confusing, uh, but it's getting better. And does anybody have any, any comments on any of that? I mean, I, do you guys agree that that's happening? Or what are you seeing out there? Just anything. Sure. That's a, that's, a, that's a very good point. So the philosophy is I, I interchange, um, I'm going to interchange this, those two in the, in the talk because, you know, it's easy, to, uh, it's easy to connect open source software with open source licensing, right? There's just a, cl a clear connection there. Um, but there's certainly more behind uh, openness and, and, free, and floss. And um, so the free side of it is obviously different from the freedom side of it and the philosophy side of it and the methodologies. Uh, and I want to get into that a little bit more. So that's a good point and uh, so, so good. Any, anything else? No? All right. Cool. Well, you guys feel, feel, feel okay to just jump in any time? Sure. Sure. Um, so the question was, you know, how how do you? I guess, how do I as a? Okay, how does the community? So how do you make um, open open document formats more pervasive? Is that kind of a good translation? Um, I don't know. You know, I'm <laughs> I don't know. I use Open Office, you know, and I'm using Google Office. I'm using uh, Google Apps, and you know, I. I've been using Ubuntu for years now, you know, and I, I don't have Windows. I mean, I, I don't know. I guess all my friends uh, are using Google Apps now, and I don't think it really even matters. Now, that's a new generation. I think that the generations before us are, you know, are going to have, are still having issues with it, right? Um, but I think it's just going to be a natural uh, a movement, you know, and it's, it's happening already. All right. So commercial software, um, before I left Microsoft, uh, you know, I was part of the, the BPOS group. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but it's, a, it's the cloud and uh, Azure group. So, um, you know, they, they certainly have a different perspective than the conventional, uh, more conventional groups at, at Microsoft and uh, certainly are more open to, you know, connectivity and integration, obviously, with the cloud uh, model. So there's growth and interoperability. Um, there's good integration there. It, it's not making as many people rich. Uh, but they certainly are getting a little more warmer. You can see there with the kittens starting to open up a little bit there. Um, on the open source side, now this is uh, this is interesting to me because, you know, you've got all these major major companies that are exploding overnight, and the majority of them are being built on open platforms. Uh, but who knows that? No, nobody knows that but us. You know, I mean, really. Uh, you know, Twitter didn't didn't uh, announce or you know publicly make it known that you know they, they started on it was it WordPress they started out on I think um, so it wasn't a you know an obvious message coming from them but you know people didn't care I think that's that's the idea they don't they don't really care what it's built on right as long as it works and does what they want it to do um, but like I said it's it's definitely fueling you know success. Um, it's not making a ton of people rich immediately. I, as you can see, there my house over on Halstead. Um, but a, a thing that I do want to talk about a little bit is the, the dual licensing models. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but uh, so Sugar CRM is, is a good example of that, where they've got uh, you know this this open community-based version, and then you've got various other versions. You've got the enterprise and the business versions of those two. Does anybody have any experience working with them uh, at a business level and sort of transitioning from that community 
based version of, of a platform, any, any platform, to a more commercialized uh, variant license. Nobody's uh, worked with like, like Sugar CRM or uh, any of the other, uh, like Alfresco or any of those guys? Nothing? All right. Crickets. <laughs> well, to me, I think it's an interesting model because it really does contradict, uh, in my opinion, uh, the, whole, the whole philosophy of open source. And, uh, you know, I've worked with platforms like Sugar, and uh, it's, it's been challenging to make that to make that uh, change from one model to the next because you've got all these intellectual property issues you've got to work with that, um, you know, not very easy to work with. So, so my point is, is I think that the, the lines are blurring. Um, you know, open source is, is certainly has a little more of a, of a commercial, uh, I don't want to say uh, model, but it has capabilities, right? And, and commercial software is becoming much more open. And you've got Miley here in, in Hannah, Montana. <laughs> so here's a, the, the philosophical um, approach that, that I think you brought up back there. Um, you know, it's this uh, beer versus uh, free beer. Free is in free is in free beer. No, sorry. Free is in free speech, not as in free beer. <laughs> and is everybody familiar with that term? Raise your hand if you've heard that before. Who who's who who coined that term? Stallman. <laughs> I think I've got it up there. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, Richard Solomon, you know, he's a big advocate of the whole free software uh, movement, right? Floss, um, Foss, uh, in, the, in the gratis versus libre uh, movement. So um, I think to me, when I think of is licensing still relevant, I, I look at licensing and, and I interchange that with open source and open source life, licensing and think, well, I don't believe that, that uh, that the philosophy behind it will ever go away, right? But I think that the model in the in the uh, the gratis versus libre uh, perspective is uh, is interesting. I mean, does anybody have any comments on this at all? In in, in kind of uh, just uh, you know, have you read anything on it, or do you guys have any feedback on um, you know this this whole perspective? Sure. Apple is leading a charge to dismantle the, the, the GNU project? Yes. Okay. And I'll, I'll give some examples for you. Yeah, no, please. Um, okay, so if you're a Mac OS, any of you are Mac OS users or all of users? Any of you are developers? Have you used the debugger? Have you noticed that it's not GDB7? Have you used the compiler? Have you noticed it's not GCC 4.6? The reason being, both of those moves in the GPL3, they will never be updated in Mac OS 10 again. It's just that simple. Ouch. And, well, it's really that simple. They're ripping uh, Samba out of uh, the next version of Mac OS because it's been moved to GPL3. Um, and they're developing their own, well, it's an open source thing, but they're developing their own compiler plan to, uh, uh, to replace GCC, and they're working on LLVD, which will replace the GDU debugger, and their own in-house whatever to replace Samba. Uh, and I'm sure there are other examples. Those are just pretty come to mind. That, oh, absolutely. Uh, that's, that's a very good point. Uh, Well, yeah, go ahead. That's a good point. So, you know, does it does it matter, right? So, because Apple's leading that charge, um, you know, you're going to have a bazillion people that are that are going to follow them, 
And unless they really believe in the open philosophy, then they're going to jump on board with them, right? I don't know. It's, I, I think it's a very valid statement. Um, it's scary, but I'm not a Mac user, so beat it. <laughs> um, so that whole, I think that whole debate is, is fun to talk about. Um, you know, it's, I read about it a lot, and I'm really fascinated with it. I'm certainly not an expert, though. Um, so if you guys have any other comments on it, I think it's, a, it's interesting dialogue. So um, again, to kind of keep this this conversation going here, you know, does it does it co does does cost matter anymore, right? So since we get everything for free, or um, you know, nine ninety nine a month to start out with, right? And I'm speaking more on a consumer consumer level, um, but even on the enterprise level now, I mean, you can get get a lot of products for under a hundred bucks a user. Um, does anybody care whether or not it's it's open? You know, I mean, if if we're all using APIs now to connect to these services, you know, who cares if it's open, right? I don't know. I think it's, uh, um, you know, and according to the average information user, they still think that, I mean, I'll, I'll explain to my friends that, you know, I use an operating system that I didn't pay for, right? And, and I customize it and I build it exactly how I like it. And they just cannot grasp it. Even my most technical friends, <clears throat> they, they really don't understand it because they're not, you know, they're kind of not um, in the technology realm, I guess. So it's definitely still a, still a challenge out there. Um, so this is kind of the, um, you know, this is sort of the backdrop for the whole conversation is with the advent and explosion of SaaS software, decentralization, and, uh, you know, platforms rising everywhere, does licensing still matter? Will the GPL and other copyleft licenses still exist three, four, five years from now? Um, you know, are they relevant if we're not using desktops anymore? Are, are you know, are we just going to be signing EULAs for our subscription to Twitter? You know, I, I don't know. Um, what do you guys think? I mean, is this something that's, that's accurate or, or is this, what are you guys seeing out there? So believe it or not, I <laughs> I have this this vision of you know five ten years from now of not far from what you what you just said. I'm sorry. What, what was your name? Chris. Chris. Um, I envision you know everyone having their own server, right? Whether it's in their house or or you know in a hosted environment, but it's theirs and it's their platform. It's theirs to customize. Um, everyone has their own domain name that, that might be issued by you know, some agency. I don't know um, what that would look like, but I think that that's, that might be a direction that we go. It's, it's a little extreme, um, given the commercial and enterprise uh, force behind cloud computing right now. I think, um, you know, it's, it's going to be tough to determine which direction we'll go in. You know, are we going to keep going in this, in this, you know, centralized platform or cloud, cloud computing, whatever marketing term you want to call it? Um, is it we're going to keep going that direction? I think there's a lot of force and money behind that right now. Um, I don't know if everyone's prepared to go and have their own server. I'd love, I'd love it. I think, I think it'd be great. Um, so that's kind of the backdrop, the backdrop of, of why I even wanted to talk today is really just to kind of, you know, bring, is is it really valid anymore? Is software is licensing valid? Period. Um, so this is kind of a, a mix between my opinion and uh, just some things that I've, I've uncovered over the past couple of years. But uh, I do believe that open source is uh, definitely the future of software. But with the cloud, I think that you know all these years we've been we've been saying you know this is the year of Linux. This is it. You know the desktop is here now. Goodbye Windows. And uh, <laughs> and now it's like you know I feel like we're missing our chance because the desktop will be dead. And, um, and that was sort of the flagship, as much as we, we all know it's not, that's the face of open source is, is the desktop, right? Linux and, and distributions. I mean, that, that is the, 
um, quote unquote, you know, face of all open source now. We know there's much more behind it, but um, you know, so are, is the window of opportunity for open source to shine, quote unquote, is that, you know, is, is it past? Um, and did we ever want it to be uh, this, this uh, celebrity operating system? You know, I don't know, or software or, you know, any, any platform at all. Um, being at a, a large, you know, corporation, a big software company, I know the commercial software is is experience is experiencing hardship right now with the adoption of cloud. Even if they, even if you have a cloud model, you're still being challenged because, uh, you know, that that desktop client that uh, you've been getting, you know, the this annual revenue from every year now is going away. So, certainly, uh, commercial licensing is seeing a major impact there. Does anybody work at a software company, or what are you guys' backgrounds? I'm just curious. Students, um, what do we got here? How about you, bud? Uh, Hard, hardware hacking. Okay. Um, so, uh, how, what's your experience working with open source and hardware? Because I know that's that's a debatable uh, yeah, topic well, too. Good. That's that's interesting. I just read about it too. Uh, the open source hardware initiative. Um, sounds neat. I don't know much about it. I, I'm not a hardware guy, but uh, it's definitely uh, interesting to see the growth too, right? Not just in software. All right. So in this uh, is a continuing uh, continuation of of that whole conversation. Is are we going to be API writers in the future? And we're going to have to work with this subscription model. And you know, the the major corporations are going to handle all the services and we just speak to them, right? And then we build our clients and, and even the clients we may not build. You know, Android, as much as Android is open source, uh, you know, I think we all know Google controls Android pretty tightly. Um, they, you know, they released Honeycomb, I don't know, a month or two ago and, you know, nobody has seen that code other than Google. So, again, I think we're starting to see this shift from, you know, everybody playing nicely with open source to you know, a, a commercial model with Google, even. Um, so, in this this is again uh, just a kind of reiteration of the, the the Cal the client access license is shifting to a service license. So, you know, now you subscribe to a uh, you know whether it's an off an Office web client or uh, a Google web app client, whatever it is, you're not getting that hard, you're not getting that software on your machine. You're getting it through a web interface. So you've got to Got to sign that EULA. Um, so the philosophies, methodologies. My opinion is that um, these things are this this whole uh, ecosystem of of uh, philosophies and methodologies behind open source and open platforms and free software. I think is is moving into other realms, right? So I think it, we're seeing this in. Obviously, in crowdsourcing is a, is a huge, huge initiative in content and skill. Um, you know, we use crowdsourcing tools all the time. And I think Linux, the Penguin, Tux is right there in the back of the room. Everybody just give them a quick wave. Hey there, all right. Come on in. Come up on stage. That's right. Our, uh, our own hero here. Look at this. Have a seat if you want. <laughs> Take it easy. <laughs> wow, celebrity sighting right here. All right. Um, so again, I think that we're seeing this this open philosophy move into other areas of our world. 
you know, I think it's carrying on to the generation that's, that's growing up right now. Um, I think, you know, I work with my, my alma mater quite a bit, Michigan State, and, you know, the open software is a part of the curriculum now. I mean, that was never a part of it when I was there, and it was a, it's a total change in mentality, I think. So I like it. I think it's, it's positive and it's good. Um, I think that we're going to continue to see this, you know, cloud, node, uh, you know, platform to continue to move forward uh, as much as I'd like to see the personal, uh, you know, web server in our, in our living rooms. Um, in, in traditional licensing will be irrelevant, I think, someday. But again, I think the pillars of, of open source, the flexibility, the, uh, you know, interoperability, uh, localization, all these things are, you know, part of the, the growth behind it, and I don't think that's something that will ever go away. I think that's something that's going to continue on in software and in tr continue to influence, I think, more in commercial software. Um, again, really this is more about uh, the generation that's coming up. Continued tsunami, I don't know, it might be a little too early to use that word, sorry. Um, but you guys understand what I'm, what I'm getting at here, this crowdsourcing movement and, and find, using the community to, to solve problems and knowing that just one mind is, uh, is a limited approach to, to solving problems. Um, and then again, this new generation is, is uh, you know, they're kind of grown up with it. So. That said, uh, I want to get some dialogue going. I mean, I know we, we have some time left, so I want to uh, really just kind of get your guys' feedback on what you, how you feel about this topic, because I certainly did not cover this thing from soup to nuts, but um, hopefully I kind of you know, brought some ideas up and, and generated some, some thoughts on what's going to be in the future of, of, of licensing. What do you guys think? Right, so anything you get for free is, uh, you know, it's too good to be true, right? Um, I don't know how to solve that problem. I, I just tell them that it's better. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I say, look, um, you know, do you like using Windows? Do you like using your Mac? Yeah, mostly they say yes to Mac. Um, but uh, I think it's just too, they just don't get it, right? Like I said, it's, it goes back to the, the roots of, of Americanism, I think, and, and uh, being able to capitalize on on creating something, you know, and people just generally just don't understand it. And again, I think it's a generational thing. I think most people under 30 years old probably get that pretty easily. Um, 30 to 40, you know, I don't know, um, somewhat. Uh, but even, I mean, I've got some older friends that, that get it totally. You know, I've got a, a very good friend. He's 70 years old and he is a huge advocate of, of open source. So. And he's not Richard Stallman, so. But that's, it's a great question. I mean, how do you provide value for it? So, you know, I think you can say, um, well, from our perspective, we, we are very, very candid and transparent about when we build software for our customers, we're using open platforms, right? And they do not cost us a dime. Now, they, we're more than happy to build them software out of the box, exactly how they like it, for a very small fee. But when it comes to customizing it and making it their own, then um, you know I think that's where that's where the opportunity lies, right? For for especially for consulting firms, um, I think that product companies are are going away. I mean they're they're disappearing, and everyone's moving to a uh, a service oriented program, not just a SOA. I mean from a product perspective, um, you know so. I think it's more going to it's going to be more around service management and being able to help uh, from a consulting perspective to help your customers um, achieve really what they need with it with a tailored solution. But for our friends that don't you know that are accountants, uh, forget it. <laughs> what else, guys? Welcome. Um, net neutrality is, uh, I'm not sure what to think about it. I, you know, I don't, I'm not very learned on the topic, to be honest. 
um, but I know that it's not something I want coming. Um, inevitably, I think it probably will, or it may even, you know, I, I don't know. Is it, is, it, is it already approved? Like, is this thing happening or what? I don't know. Nah, who knows? But it probably will. It's been brought up, you know, multiple times within uh, government, and it's concerning, but um, I don't know. It's another revenue model for, for, you know, a major corporation, right? I think the, I think the pipes should be free, but, you know, the subway isn't, so. Well, what, what's your opinion on it? So you mean the telco, com telco companies, right? Sure. So that's going to be the way for them to, uh, to compensate for the, the loss of. Rather than them innovating, it's an easy way to get it more Right. And they, and they get the politicians who have no idea what they're doing to, uh, to agree to it. Yeah, that is a, well, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of advocacy out there to prevent that. Uh, hopefully that uh, there's enough. But, you know, I, I personally, I know I've signed several uh, online, um, I don't know what the, what the yeah, pr yeah, and uh, these petitions that are going around, and, and I don't know if they're effective or not, but, uh, you know, I, haven't cer I certainly haven't seen any, any change in my bandwidth prices yet, so hopefully we don't. <laughs> what, uh, what else, guys? What, anything else about, you know, uh, licensing, you guys are, you guys just came in, are you guys, uh, what's your background? Okay. Are you here for the licensing talk or are you just, okay, cool. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about kind of commercial versus open source licensing. Do you guys have any opinion on, um, I guess, the future and what you see, uh, even from a development perspective, do you see, uh, you know, this, this software as a service model, cloud model, interfering with open source's future and, and, and it, more importantly, the licensing aspect of open source. Kind of an open-ended question, but, you know. Yeah. Right. So, you know, from a cloud perspective, does it matter if the API is just as robust as, a, you know, for a .NET service as it is for, uh, you know, PHP or Ruby or, you know, any other platform out there? It's, it's almost like, well, we don't have real true root access. I mean, we could. Um, do we want it? I don't know. I don't think so. If, they, if they've got the servers updated and everything's secure. Um, That's, that's right. So, um, well, if they don't, that's illegal. But, <laughs> you know, um, but that's, that's, that's true. You know, so uh, security is a big, big part of that. And, you know, they've, these big software companies have gone out of their way to make sure that the cloud platforms are secure um, because there's been this huge, uh, you know, pushback from corporations and governments that uh, they don't believe that cloud computing is secure. And, you know, the truth is it's probably more, 100 more times secure than their own platforms. But, you know, um, what else? Anybody else have any interesting uh, ideas? Oh, yep, go ahead. So if uh, if Facebook became open source, so how do you mean? I think there might be a couple of, of forks, maybe, and and would people move? I don't think so. No, I mean, why would they? You know, why change? It's like, you know, if your car, you know, if it's running good, why? Uh, why move to another car, or why buy a new house? If uh, you know what I mean, um, it, there'd have to be a compelling reason to move, you know. And, and, uh, and why would you want to reinvent the wheel? You know, is it just because you want to have your own customized version of Facebook? Um, I wouldn't, because I wouldn't want to deal with the bugs, right? They fix everything for me. I don't want. I don't want to deal with that. And uh, they do a pretty good job of it. But 
I bet if they opened it up, I bet they would never have to worry about competition. You know, they just said, here's the code. I mean, look at, uh, you know, look at open, open Office or Star Office. You know, Sun still sells Star Office, but they don't, you know, they still give it away. Yep, you, it, sorry. If you said if if you get bored of <laughs> if you get bored of the open source model, uh, open protocols, you know, like a SMTP or sure. Right. So if they provide a a, a more open OP, API, is that? Right. There's the Facebook markup language, you know, and is everybody has anybody used FBML? It's pretty limited, but whatever. You can you can build a login on your website. Drupal has a plugin for it. Uh, there's one behind you. So, so you think opening it up would, would improve the experience because of the community, you know, fixing bugs or, or making it more robust? I, yeah, I think I think it's possible, definitely. So that's a different angle, though, right? So you're you're saying, let's use the community to solve our problems. Here's the here's the platform. Fix it for us. I think that's that's probably something that's fi find the problems. Yeah, um, rather than go build. You know, Shmesh, Shmesh book or whatever it is, Shmoogle. You know, I don't know. The next, the next social network, whatever it is. Uh, there's one in the back. I'll come right back up. Go ahead. So last week they announced that they were going to start to close down their API a little bit. Right? They're not going to make it as open. They're, they're, and a lot of people are pissed because they built a lot of applications around those, and now they're going to block them and they're going to do their own thing. They want their own apps. Right? Um, so does anybody listen to Twit? You're listening to Leo, Leo Laporte. All right. So um, you guys listened last week. About the this, and he, and he talked about it a little bit. He had uh, I forget who he had on, but you know, it's I think these these big companies are getting a little more greedy. Um, you know, so uh, the open the open the open mentality uh, may be pulling back a little bit. I, I don't know. You know, I mean, uh, the the Twitter thing was was a, there was an uproar, you know, in the, in the community, and uh, so even like. Uh, you know, there's an app out there, a web app, uh, Sprout Social. I don't know if you guys have used that. It's a local local company. They're over in the Groupon building. Um, so got some friends over there, and you know, they that's a big part of the platform is to be able to use and monitor Twitter from your account to do more of, a, of an enterprise management of your social media, but um, and particularly for for customers or for an enterprise social media manager. Um, but that is going to have a major impact on uh, on Sprout Social. Right, because that's like half of their platform. Um, 
So I'm not sure what they're thinking. Maybe they're just getting a little more green. They're seeing that uh, you know, this open model maybe isn't the, the you know, is it lucrative enough? I, I don't know. But is Twitter open? Is, how are you finding open? It's just, here's some APIs you can talk to to do some controlling on Twitter. It's not open. And if I said open, I didn't mean open. Well, it's, you've been saying it all the time. It's, you have APIs in the cloud, but how's that different from that function call to a random DLL? Sure. It's no different. There's no. no interface at all. It's, a, it's another language, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sort of, yes. Right. Yeah, I. I don't know. I'm not. I'm definitely not an expert in that. But uh, you know, for me, I think about it a lot because we have customers that you know need our advice on this stuff, and, and, and it's so hard to even predict what what it's going to be like a week from now, you know, and, and why they want a Facebook page. I'm just like, <laughs> why? You know, why do they want to log in for for uh, LinkedIn on their website? You know, it's useless. Um, go ahead. Sure. So an example of a good revenue model for open, in, in the open source world. Um, well, so I talked about, I hate to talk about it, but Red Hat obviously was, is, is like the only enterprise that's ever really um, kind of embraced open source and built a, built a company on it that's somewhat successful. Um, you know, in, in the majority of that is, is services, right? I don't think they make a lot of money on their, on their, uh, their enterprise server is definitely a big product of theirs. Um, but I think they have a lot of services and they're shifting, right? So even at Microsoft, um, you know, this, the, the notion of having a services group within Microsoft, where I was, I was a part of, you guys must have been, um, I covered the, the consulting side for Microsoft's government consulting, and um, you know there was a it was sort of like this battle between the product side and the services side, right? Because a lot of the services could accomplish the same thing as a product could, right? From potentially less or more, you know, depending on what the if it was a custom solution. So the revenue model, um, you know, that's not open source, obviously, but the revenue model I think is in is in services. Um, in, in really helping organizations adapt and modify platforms. I don't think, you know, selling, I don't think there's any model in selling open source software. That's, I mean, just inherently that's not, I don't think that's what it was really ever meant for. Does that kind of, kind of answer your question? <laughs> um, I don't know. We got two minutes left. Does anybody have a, a last comment? Uh, anything in general, just what, what you think, what's the future? What are we going to have to deal with uh, five years from now? I, I think that um, the same way uh, that GPL and things like that keeps uh, 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 the software open, uh, like it's similar to make uh, a, a software service that's going to stay open the same way, I think the analogy would be So, in other words, the, the GPL would move to a, uh, a cloud EULA kind of environment, say? Well, no, what I mean is that, what I mean is that uh, you can escape, if, 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 let's say, some decided to make a closed down version or, or I guess a portable on set, make a bad closed down version of OpenOffice that you don't really like anymore, you can escape, there's deeper apps right? They can do that. You can't do that with Facebook. But supposedly the diaspora of our sort of escape out when the people started the diaspora started to do things that were kind of shady or you know, people didn't like, there's an escape because diaspora works by federation, right? So you, you, you don't lose all your friends by switching to another code. You, 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 they all communicate with each other. Other it's, so it's a decentralized sort of model. Right. So I think that would be the best way if, if you want to keep, you know, user control of the Right. And that's actually what um, Leo talked a little bit about Twitter, right? So if there was another Twitter that came out that was more open, which there is, um, it's called, uh, what is it? Identica. What is it, Identica? Yeah, there's a couple of them, you know? But are we all gonna switch over? Shit, I don't know. I'd, I'd like to, but none of my friends follow me on Identica. <laughs> well, thank you guys, I uh, appreciate it, and uh, 
Enjoy the rest of the, the conference.